Right, good. We have a lot of uh, ordinary folks. All right, come to the front. My name is Gilbert. Well, I'm the event organizer. Thanks a lot for coming. Right, we are expecting a huge crowd. So if you can get the best seats, it's good. It will last until 7 p.m. Right, the event will last from 4 to 7. Is it okay? We have eight wonderful speakers. Before they even start, I want you to give a warm welcome to all our speakers. Give them a hand. It takes a lot of courage to come up to speak. Right, we have approached close to 30 people. Only eight patrons have the courage to come up and speak. Right, we really have to honor and respect them. It's going to be a heated event. Right. We are not going to talk about a few things, right? Or else I get into trouble. Is it okay? You help me, I help you. Right, so that I can organize events again. We're not going to talk about race. Is it all right? No race, no religion. I don't want to get into trouble so that I can organize events again like this for you. So no race. And I also want to mention to all the Indians, I'm not anti-Indian. Right? The event has a tone, right, of uh, racism. But I want to announce to you that I'm not anti-Indian. I know there are some Indians here. Right, we even have uh, approached needy Indians during the Bavali to give out Ang Pao to them, those needy Indians to celebrate the Bavali. So if I'm anti-Indian or racist, I won't do that, right? Am I right? Yeah. So we want to clear the elephant of the room. We are not, we also are not going to talk about one person, Ramish. You can see that Ramish is out of the picture. Right. No, it's not a joke. Because if I put his name here, I get into trouble. <laughs> right. So today I want to warn and talk to the speakers. Please don't mention Ramish because he can sue you. Okay? Don't mention him. If you want to talk about the incident, just mention a certain person a certain person or a certain situation, but don't mention his name. Is it okay? Right, so that we can get this going. After the event, there's no police coming after me. I don't have to run away. I won't get sued by the police or the prime minister or even Ramesh himself. So we want to set that right. Is it okay, Singapore? Yes, we are together, right. I can't sleep this few nights. Why? No, no, not because of the event. Because I feel painful that my fellow Singaporeans do not have a proper job. There are top three jobs in Singapore for Singaporeans. First is Grab driver. Tiobo, Grab driver, number one job for you. Second job is security officer. Third job is cleaners. Right, these are all the jobs available for Singaporeans and it perturbs me, it disturbs me. Right, it do not give me good sleep in the evening because I care for my country, right? I care for you Singaporeans, right? I want this to be, the tone to be set right. That we are here for jobs. We are here for employment. We are here for SICA. SICA is a very damaging treaty signed against Singaporeans. It gives a lot of leverage to Indians from India to work here. There are 127 jobs available to Indians from India. It encompasses a lot of white-collar jobs, jobs that Singaporeans can do. But because of SICA, the free trade agreement, a lot of these jobs are gone. That's why you have to work as a grab driver, you have to work as a security officer, and even a cleaner. Right, so we're going to talk a lot about SICA. Is it okay? Well, if we talk about SICA, right, if we talk about employment, we talk about why Singaporeans nowadays are so chum. Why no? Why Dr. Tan Cheng Bok even has to raise this Sika issue when he launched his party? And why Dr. Chi also mentioned about Sika? Surely there's something in it, right? Surely something is not right. Why do we have to stop so low? Right? Unable to pay our mortgages? Unable to send our kids to schools? Unable to put rice and food on the table for us? Why Singaporeans have to stoop so low? This disturbs me a lot. I know where you come here because you are disturbed. You Beisong, right? 
you are not happy that a foreigner can earn so much, $66,000 a month, when we even have to stoop so low to earn a few thousand dollars a month. Right, these are things that make you come. I know it's very hot here. Well, I get a summer. <laughs> right, I can talk non-stop for three hours about the things that Singaporeans go through, but I'm not going to go to that. Right, because there are eight speakers. Each of them have 15 minutes. So at the end of 10 minutes, right, where's Dara? Someone will show you a card to say that you have five minutes left. So the next card will show that you have no time left. So at the second card, you have to leave the stage. Because there are eight of you, right? There's a whole program. We're also going to have midway, a contest for posters. If you bring a posters, right, please show it to us. There are three prizes for the best three posters here. Is it okay? It's going to be a long event, right? If you can sit down, sit. For people like me, right, the legs very weak one, now, I'll take a seat. Right, if you're above a certain age, right, you can't stand, stand too long, please sit. Right, the behind, you can sit on the glass. I think it'd be more comfortable, right, if you just sit down. There be, there's also going to be a lot of shouting, right? We're going to shout slogans. Is it okay? I find the events here very tame. We're not like Hong Kong, huh? right? Hong Kong will they go on the street to protest. I'm not saying you should do that, but I think we should be a bit more active. Is it okay? So I'm going to say a slogan. Can you follow me, Singaporeans? Follow up to me, right? I say something, you follow me. Say no. I think you can do better. Say no. To Sika. Say no. To 6.9. Say no. To PAP. No, no, they want the last one. No, no, no. The last one cannot say Asala. <laughs> I go through again. Say no. To Sika. Say no. To 6.9. Say no. To Sika. Say no. To 6.9. Okay, wonderful. Give yourself a hand of applause. Right. Some of you come alone. Some of you come with a boyfriend, your wife, your husband. But can I ask you, right, for Singaporeans' sake, for unity's sake, can you shake three persons' hands? Three persons' hands that you don't know, shake their hand. Right. Ask them, who are you? Right. Where do you stay? Pongo, Bukit Timah, Pasuris. Right. Shake three persons' hands over there. Right. We want Singaporeans to stay united. Right. We are divided by race, you know, right? There's Malay, Eurasian, Indians, Chinese, right? But we're not going to let this stop us from uniting together. We're not going to let the government, the authorities, divide and rule us. Race is used to divide and rule us. It's not right. We are, first of all, Singaporeans. We are Indians, yes. We are Chinese. We are Malays. We are Eurasian. But first of all, the main thing is we are Singaporeans. And we ought to be very proud of that. The first speaker is someone who is in the security line. Well, you know, uh, security, 12 hours, six days a week, 72 hours a, w a week, and you only get paid 1,008. The max is 2,000. We have seen security officers going through a rough time. I respect Stephen. Right, Stephen is actually featured here. Alamak, can I cannot see his face? Right. Can I help you? Yeah. Right, we want to remember Stephen. You know why? Because he encompasses the real Singaporean spirit. He did not falter. He did not lose his temper when someone scored him. He said, you're living in HDB. I'm not. I'm living in the one by five million condo. But he is one great guy. Give a hand to Stephen. But I do not, do not know whether he's here or not. But we want to respect him. He's someone that makes us feel very proud. He did not retaliate. He acted calmly. But I guess, hopefully, he does not lose his job. Right, I know his uh, services are terminated. Right, the security services are terminated. But let's hope he does not lose his job. Right, without further ado, I leave the mic to Joe Chim Lau. Give him a big hand, Singaporeans. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm here to tell you about how we security officers uh, face every day, almost every day, okay, whether it's good or bad. 
But first and foremost, let me introduce myself to you. I'm Joy Kim Lau. I'm a security officer. I work in agency as well as in in-house. I know like, like Uncle Stephen has faced a tremendous challenge. And furthermore, he has really, really uh, brave, put up a brave fund to the resident itself. First and foremost, there are 60,000 licensed security officers throughout Singapore. Only 35 to 40,000 of them are in the security force. The rest, maybe they take it as part-time. Okay, Wait until they lose their job, then they go into security. So at the end of the day, we all are prepared for the worst to come. Okay. And furthermore, there are 275 agencies throughout Singapore that caters for people who are doing part-time or full-time. That means condos, hotels, banks, other places, and including Tuas site. Tuas, I can tell you that, is a very ulu place. Some of them don't have toilets. Some of them don't have uh, proper facility. Let me get back to this, uh, what we are doing. Our first main job is to protect the lives of all, um, I would say, condominiums, uh, buildings, factories, and also the premises of the security of, his, of itself. So every day when we face the public, we are first, first uh, so-called first um, people to face, okay? Uh, customer service, as a customer service. We also do customer service also to help these people, especially residents or people uh, who are working in the factories, you know, to come in, tap their card, whatever it is. So we do greet them, uh, ensure that there's nothing happen from that day. So all of us are very, pro all of us are very, very protective about the scenario itself, including human lives. So at the end of the day, we are humbly to like a uh, uh, servant to you all to protect your lives. And it, so let me tell you about how we get into this security. First and foremost, most of us, the present generation, most of us are highly, highly, uh, how you say, um, highly educated, from diploma right up to masters. Yes, masters. Those who have a degree in masters don't have a job. Okay. So at the end of the day, yeah, they have okay. to resort to the next best security or yeah. grab drivers or panda food, whatever it is, okay? Food delivery. So security itself gives you a sustenance from day to day. If you work in agency, you get cash. If you work in in-house, you get money paid with a CPF. But at the end of the day, it is whether you work 12 hours, 8 hours, or 6 hours, or relief, okay, part-time. Your job is to enforce certain laws of the premises as well as certain laws of execute the powers against terrorism. For me, I every day face the, the same uh, so-called situation. I always, in, in, whether in in-house or agency, we have to greet People like you serve people like you. We take pride in our job. But there are some, of, co of course, uh, there are some people who don't look down on, uh, who look down on us. They are, some of them, you know, very big shots. I won't, I won't say anything, but I keep it to a minimum. Big shots, you know, will call you. And some of them will call you, hey, come here, like a dog, okay? Come here. Some of them will be nice to you and say, Excuse me, uh, where can I go to this place and so So we cater for every human kind. So uh, let us be civil to our security guards, to our people who are Singaporeans, you know, who are working daily lives to earn a living, uh, so-called a humble living that we all treasure. So this is what our this is what we we face off. So at the end of the day, thank you for people who are coming here and people who really respect us. If you do see any of security guards, say good morning to him or her. These are the people who will be helping you in case of emergency. Thank you very much.
Testing. Yes, test. Can you hear me? Yeah, I just want to ask Joe Chin. Give a hand, Joe Chin. Right, for so brave to come and speak to us. So I just want to interview Joe Chin. All right. Joe, yeah, do you think that Stevens uh, acted rightly? Yes, he put up a brave front. I respect him. As a senior supervisor or a security supervisor, he really showed great, tremendous, you know, on, on his on his on his part. And we normally face this kind of uh, red, red, ridicule, I call it ridicule, harassment. We do face every day. Very sad, but I hope that other, if he gets sacked, I hope, I hope he don't, uh, if he gets sacked, other agencies or in-house will take him in. Because we know that if these people can work, we will definitely grab him on. Singaporeans comes first. Yeah, one more question before we let Joe Chin go off. Do you think the <laughs> the the person, the resident, right? I don't want to mention his name. The Ramish resident has acted correctly. What can you do? You know, what can you do to make it better? That's a simple way, huh? Every problem, I always tell this to people. You know, every problem, whether it's in health problem, main money problem, working problem, whatever, marriage problem, there's a solution. Okay. For he, for him. For this resident, I won't mention his name, for him, either his visitors or him, just pay the $10, nothing will have happened. Okay? At the end of the day. Just pay the $10, no need to argue, just pay. Yes. Here in Singapore is what? Correct. You understand. We know. Okay? Uh, so at the end of the day, you know, no need to argue, no need to quarrel, no need to fight, whatever. That. Because in the end, uh, you get yourself into hot soup. Right now, it's starting to dig, you know, dig all the way. Tam now. So another last question for Jo Chin. Do you think that the security officer should upload the video for the public to watch? Is it illegal? I agree. I agree with you. Yes. Because like again, I say in my, in my speech, we face harassment every day, ridiculing. Every day we face. So, do you as a human being, if every day your wife scold you, you can tahan or not? Cannot, right? If your husband, you know, you're a woman, you know, you're a married woman, your husband every day, you know, harass you, 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 you can tahan or not? You won't. You definitely won't. Even the children also cannot tahan also. Correct or not? After today, I heard Joe Chim get to keep his job. <laughs> Give my hand, Joe Chin. Before we let him off as a Singaporean, both of us are going to wave the flag together. Is it okay with you, Singapore? Yes. We're going to wave our flag, right? We are from Singapore. Singapore for Singaporeans. Okay, Singapore Singaporean for Singaporeans. First. Yes, Singaporean first. All the speakers that will be speaking today will have a chance to wave the flag with me. Great, right? <laughs> Joe Chin, big hand for this security officer. A very tough job, but certainly a respect, respectable job. Right, thank you, Joe. Yeah. The next speaker is an Indian. Right, I always thank God. Right, we have various components, various races for the event. We have an Indian, we have a Malay, right, later on, and we also have several Chinese. So it's a very multiracial kind of an event, right? We don't want to stick to all Chinese or all Malays or all Indians. So it's very, very balanced and I like that. But well, I think in Singapore, we tend to look at each other by race. Well, I know some of you, the minority races, you feel insecure. The minority races, right? Jobs. Some of them, they say, oh, I require you to speak Chinese to tell you off directly that you can't apply for the job. It's not right. Right? To the employers, I say it's not right. That you see, you should use language or religion or race to discard the minority races from having proper jobs. Am I right, Singapore? Yes, we should not do that. Right, all citizens, all Singaporeans, regardless of race and religion, should have the right access to a proper job. Am I right? Yes. Before we pass the mic to Siva Kumar, we're gonna shout our slogan again. Is it okay? Say no to Sika. Say no, no. to 6.9. 6 
Say no. no. To PAP. No. I forget lah. That one, the last one, no lah. Cannot say. <laughs> I forgot again. Okay, without further ado, Mr. Siva Kumar. Big hand for him. Hello everyone. Okay, um, time to time you have um, minor ailments like uh, cough, cold, fever, headache, stomach ache. We go to the doctor and the doctor after examining says, small matter, la. small matter. Okay, it's just small matter. Just hope that um, it's not a symptom of something uh, more serious. Okay. Small, uh, when, it, when the doctor says it's a symptom, it means you apply some mild medication or even if you just leave it as it is and just manage it, it will face, uh, face itself off. Okay? Just hope that it is not something of an insidious nature, of a, uh, of a more uh, serious underlying concern. Okay, so... Today we are here to understand a little bit more of what the symptoms have shown and what the underlying cause could be. And in my view, it very likely is, though I'm not a doctor, but I'm just uh, from a socio-economic point of view. Good afternoon, fellow Singaporeans, ladies and gentlemen. A few days before Tibawali, we had, what, before Tibawali, we had some fireworks somewhere, but, uh, okay. So on Tibawali, which is supposed to be the festival of lights, many of us uh, learned something and got enlightened how human beings tend to behave under certain circumstances. It enlightened many people, but some are a little slow, some probably uh, it will take a long time. So what we are going to do here today, we don't go into too much of a detail as to what are the symptoms. And we focus more of our attention on what those symptoms that we see prior to the Deepavali Day could actually be warning us. Now, before we go into a discussion of what those underlying causes are, let us very clearly, very, very clearly agree what it is not. First, it is not a racial issue. Okay? Now, why I say that? I received WhatsApp over the last two days giving me a lot of stories don't do that, don't do this, it could be this, could be that, suggesting that it could be something that's very serious. No, nothing like that. Let me assure my fellow Singaporean, nothing like that. We know there were two persons involved at the center of the controversy, the altercation. They were of two different races, yes. But what if the race was interchange? Any problem? Any, any difference? What if the race, both of them of the same race? Any issues with that? No. It is all a base, uh, based on human interaction of failure to understand human tendencies. So, it is not, let, me, let us be very clear, let not anyone tell us that it's a racial issue. No. If anyone still insists that it's a racial issue, I am here. My name is Siva Kumaran Chalapa. Those who know me very well, I have communicated my um, inclination. Where is possibly the right and wrong? I don't have to go into details. So, if it doesn't matter to me, and let me assure, assure you to a lot of my Indian friends too, this is no racial issue. Okay, there is another 
twist in that claim that this is a racial issue. There was this morning I received another WhatsApp claiming that the title says what I don't want to say. That becomes another uh, point of contention. It says Sika. Now, let's generalize the matter. It is not only pertaining Sika that we are talking here. We are talking about trade packs, ill-conceived, um, not well thought out, and being forced onto the people, okay, by the establishment. That is what we are most concerned concern about. And Sika just happened to be one of them. Okay? So we are not talking about Sika per se, but the general tendency to enter into trade packs, which could harm the people's interests. We almost entered TPP, but thanks to Trump, perhaps, we did not. Okay. Let us um, put the racial story outside and go to the more substantial part of what we are here for today. Let us be clear on some fundamentals. The country is the resource of the people, or rather, uh, the resources of the country belongs to the people, whether it's land, water, or air, manpower, tax money, CPF money included. Huh? CPF is becoming almost like tax, so I have to include that. Okay. So all these are actually the collective property of the people. Anyone disagree? I'm sure no one will disagree. No one in his right frame of mind will raise a finger in disagreement. No one. Okay. These are essentially the tangibles. Tangibles we can feel, we can see, we can touch. But there is there are some intangibles, those are also belonging to the people. The economy of the country. Does it belong to the people? Or it's, it belongs to someone who is supposedly taking care of the economy, growing it, watering it every day, let it grow, let it flourish. So the economy belongs to us. Does an exclusive group can lay claim to that as their property, the economy is theirs. Is there such an exclusive group? Okay. There is no exclusive group which can say that the economy belongs to them. It belongs to the people, full stop. So are the educational resources, infrastructure, and such. So, we have the economy, the intangible, that belongs to the people, but yes, we appoint or, or elect um, a government to take charge of it. When I say appointment or elect, I'm taking the civil service as well as the elected members of parliament cabinet as a collective body who manages the economy. They manage the economy for the interests of the people. In The government does that. And within the government, there is a small subset group, okay, elected, and from the, I'm not supposed to say the party name, is it? So, ruling party. Okay, all right. So, such is the situation. The government of the day is supposed to manage the resources of the people with policies, hopefully sound policies, formulated by the ruling party. Now, what we have in the uh, turn of the century, they are supposed to manage the economy, right? For the people, right? Okay, what happened? I have with me a document. Some of you, you know, might, when I say document, uh, 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 sudden uh, gasp or oh, it's not some secret document or anything like that I don't want to become another what uh, Snowden or Assange on the run you know, not, no fun so this is actually from a very harmless and a mild harmless and a mild additional mathematics textbook 
Okay? This textbook, there is a question. Uh, who want, whoever wants to see this uh, uh, piece of, uh, this page of the textbook can go to my Facebook page. You can see it there. It talks about the population of Singapore being uh, 3.92 million in year 2000 and it was projected to grow at a rate of 1.8% every year. So, based on that, the question asked in 2008, what's the population? Next, it asked in which year it will be 5.5 million. Which year is it? 5.5 million. Anyone knows? What is the population now? So, the answer was correct. The book gave the answer as about 2019. Now, further, I just tried out the formula and entered the year beginning of 2030, end of, sorry, end of 2030. The formula, was, the formula gave me a number of 6.9 million, approximately. So, the decision to up the population to 6.9 million was not decided in 2013. It was already there as a scheme much earlier in 2000. And recently, I also went to check the formula. When would it be 10 million? It gave the year approximately 2050. So upping the population seems to be the prime goal of the present government. For what purpose? Of course, we can always analyze later. But that being a prime goal seems to be very much up there. And all these SICA and such, all the other trade packs are actually helping towards achieving that goal. And what is it doing to the people as a consequence? Nothing. The people are just seeing that their livelihoods are compromised. Where you can find work for a certain salary in normal times, suddenly you find yourself being sidelined by your potential employers. Now, basically we know this is not fair. Who does the economic resources belong to? The people. Now, I am not, let's not be xenophobic as they always like to call us. We are not saying zero foreigners and it's not negotiable, we are not. We are saying yes, we can take we can admit foreigners into the economy, but make sure that there is some calibration. You have to make sure that the actual owners of the economy, the people of Singapore, are not sidelined. Was that done? They may claim, but to my view, it's not. You have to maintain a certain ratio to balance. Everybody needs to make a living. You want to admit foreigners, by all means, go ahead. Selectively, we welcome foreign talents. They will, in fact, help us. During my days in the university, I had lecturers from other countries, Hong Kong, India, even China. So, what's the problem? We, they, some of them are still there. Now, I have been unemployed a few times. I never thought those lecturers are actually taking my jobs. I never say that I should be the one actually be in that position. Because I know for a fact, they are better than me. They are real foreign talents. They deserve what they have. So we are accommodating. We are not xenophobic as, as they always like to claim. Now, we have a population of something like, um, we soon will have a population of something like seven plus million. The world population is about 7.5 billion thereabouts. Now, if it goes on like this, very soon 
we will have one out of every 1,000 inhabitants of planet Earth in Singapore. One out of 1,000. Is Singapore even the one out of 1,000th one of the livable land space of planet Earth? So, obviously, there is a case of overcrowding, and this overcrowding in the long run will leave some with property which is shot through the roof and some short change because they have to pay for that overpriced property. All a minister could say is, it's affordable, ma. So, this will lead to an exacerbated state of inequality. Some with more of the resources, some with abjectly low amount of resources. Do you even have to create inequality? That in itself is the driver of inequality in the social economics of the country. This has to be addressed. Now, by running up the population numbers, we are not helping to address that population. Now, I looked through the dictionary this morning. Is there any word called xenophilia? Uh, xenophilia happens to be the logical opposite of xenophobia. There is no such word. Because nobody ever thought, there is no reason why one would be loving the foreigners so much. Not that we are asking you to hate them, that would be xenophobia. We are saying that, have a balance. Okay? If you gave so much to foreigners, that much less you have to give to your own locals. That is what we are facing now. When you have that much less to give to your own locals, what happens? There's shortage. Okay, once there is shortage, there is simmering discontent. Okay? Undercurrents. Given the slightest opportunity, it expresses itself. That's what we had probably in the last instance. Okay, that is the cause. All you need is a small symptom as an indication of that. We had the indication. Let's hope whoever concerned addresses the serious, the more insidious nature of the problem. Now, one more thing. We um, locals have to do national service, right? But I don't think... Uh, another 15 minutes? Ah, no, okay, never mind. <laughs> okay, so, anyway, Shiva another Kuma. time. Thank you. Give him a hand. Singapore, Siva Kumar. Right, I want to ask you a question, Siva. Yeah, how do you feel as an Indian about this whole uh, rummish incident? Like, do you feel it's a racist thing that Singaporeans overreacted? Okay, it is absolutely not racist. There is nothing to talk about racism at all. Anyway, the matter has been churned over and over again, and to some extent, I have contributed to it. On, but anyway, that's besides the point. Uh, the let's say that it. First of all, the security guard in question behaved in a most commendable manner. He maintained his cool. He did not allow the problem to get out of hand. He exercised utmost restraint. And to some extent, the car owner, I sympathize with him and he's a little bit of a victim in the sense that he, this uh, matter get blown up, but I hope he learns. He learns his lesson and learn to be more patient and tolerant with those who, are, who may not be as endowed as him. Probably, okay, I'm, I'm not um, uh, accusing him or anything, but I hope he learns. Yeah, also, another question before we let Siva off. Do you think as an Indian, as a minority race, you face difficulty in getting jobs compared to the Chinese or the Malay, you know? Okay. Uh, um, it would be totally a, a falsehood to say that um, no, I don't. Okay? To a small extent, I do. But it is a, only a small extent. But it is 
a manageable extent, um, we all will get used to it. Most Singaporeans may have a slight problem in that regard, but it is nothing that is um, you should lose, lose sleep over. Big hand for Siva Kumar, right. Yeah, as promised, he has a chance to wave the Singapore flag with me. Give a hand for Singapore. Singapore for Singaporeans. Singaporean first. Okay, Singapore. Thank you, Siva Kumar. Thank you. Yeah, I have a soft spot for people like Siva Kumar, the Indians and the Malays. Right? I know it's difficult for you. Right? We actually have uh, counseling and coaching services right, for those who are jobless, for those who are divorced and the poor. And many of our clients are Malays and Indians. 80% uh, of those whom we help for needy cases are from the Malay and Indian families. Right, just two weeks ago, we went to Amokyo, right, Amokyo Town Council. Right, we actually offer help to four families. Three of them are Malays and one is an Indian. Right, two have cancer, one has stroke, and one has a physical disablement. So I realized, yeah, this particular segment, even though they are very small, but they are very poor, I think a lot of the opportunities are not going to their way. They face adverse difficulties, right? Whenever they apply for good jobs, whenever they go to the employment sector, right? Whenever employers interview them, I find there's a slight discrimination against them. Right, as a Chinese, I can say that. Right, as a Chinese, I say, if an employer here, please give fair hiring opportunities to the minority races, to the Indians and to the Malays. Right, they have been stereotyped. Right, a lot of people say, oh, Malays are into drugs. Indians are into alcohol. But Chinese, Chinese are into gambling, you know. Right, we, we are a big time gambler. I gamble a bit lah, when I was young. <laughs> Now don't have, uh, don't have money to buy Toto, right? Don't have money to buy stock. Yeah, I lost six figures, right, when I buy stocks. But now no money, really no money to buy. Right. So we have our own problem, uh, Chinese. We are minor we are the majority, but we have our own issues. Same for the Malays and the Indians. But let let's not talk about race, is it okay? We are all one people, right? One race and one country. Okay? We have a lady, single mother. Who is speaking next, Karina? Right. She emailed me frequently about her troubles. She is someone that I respected. I met her two months ago in Hans uh, National Library. And we have a good chat. She's a dear mother. Right. She has a very, very painful story. Right. And she actually gave the authorities some trouble. She emailed to all the Prime Minister, the PMO, the Ministers, right, for attention. I think she's someone respectable, admirable, someone who actually has a lot of love for her two sons, particularly the younger son, who is now in drug rehab center. Without further ado, let's give a big hand to Karina Tan. Oh, yours. to my family, my son especially. I have a little correction. Uh, it's my elder son, not the younger one. His name is Ian Law. And he's not well treated because um, 
You see, as parents, uh, when we enlist him into national service, we didn't know that he already had some mental instability. I mean, you know, boys are boys. They can be rascals. They can be very mischievous, very naughty. And he keeps saying, Mommy, I don't want to go serve national service. I don't want to go na serve national service. So everyone in the family, in-laws and not, will just stand behind and push him. No, you have to go. This is the law. If you don't go, we'll get into trouble. You will get into trouble. So we just blindly follow the law. We follow the law and guess what happened? Um, mean death, shockingly, do not have the expertise to diagnose people with mental problems. They are very good with physic physicality, maybe emotionally, I don't know. But mental issues, they totally don't have. Because um, when Ian was enlisted um, to try to escape NS, he went to take some illegal drugs so that he can be uh, caught and be sent to DRC so that he thinks that by doing this, he can escape national service. But then that's not, that's not the case because after he served uh, DRC, they, they sent him back to, uh, to detention and then they sent him back to uh, uh, civil defense. And then he has to go through all these uh, very tedious uh, uh, um, drills that um, the SCDF will uh, impose on, the, uh, on, on these young boys. And because Ian is mentally not stable, He's not able to take the vulgarities, the, uh, the verbal abuse that was hurled onto him every single day. I mean, how would you feel as a boy if your officers, when they open a sentence, they, tell, they, they, they use vulgarity aiming at your mother's genital? I think this is, this is one of the worst things you do to a kid, to a child, to a, to, to, a young, to a young guy freshly out of school. This is unacceptable. I mean... You have double standard outside. They're supposed to behave like a civil person. But inside, you have officers screaming vulgarities at them every single day for two years. Guess what happened to this boy? Mentally, what do you think happened to the mind of this boy or any other boy? Now, let me ask you, if you have a son, a nephew, a brother, a son-in-law, you're involved. Make it voluntary, not compulsory, not mandatory. Because... I believe if it's voluntarily, they will really, really serve national service and not choking. How many of them have choking? How many? They will take fake MCs all the time. They smoke like chimneys, they drink like fishes. These are the bad habits that they pick up. Anyway, enough of that. I wrote my last 12 pages letter to our PM Lee and he had not replied. I sent him a reminder he had not replied over the years. Since 2012, I have been writing again and again and again. I, I wrote to Chief of Police, Mr. So Wai Wa, telling him to stop the barbaric treatment they had been giving Ian because uh, Ian said that he's suicidal. And guess what? The treatment they gave him is they chained him to the bed for more, on two occasions for more than a month with a white light shining on him. What do you think will happen to him? for more than a month on two occasions, just because he says he's suicidal. And then, to me, that is mind rape. Mind raping him. And there is no other rape worse than mind raping a boy that is so helpless. And then when he's discharged finally from civil defense, he was totally broken. If you're interested to know what is happening to my family, you can visit my Facebook page, Karina Tan, and tomorrow, by tomorrow, I, will, I already have a few uh, letters. Uh, the, uh, I have documented correspondence with all the relevant, relevant ministries. So if you're interested, you can go to my Facebook page and then be updated. And what I'm saying also is this is for all Singaporeans. Your son, your brother, your nephew, your son-in-law, they are all involved. We don't want to have another Aloysius. We don't want to have another Dave Lee. In fact, what happened to Ian has far-reaching consequences than Dave Lee. Dave Lee was quite swift, actually, even Aloysius.
the, 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 the amount of suffering, pain, it was heart-wrenching just watching Ian. The amount of, uh, I mean, we, we sent him to IMH, we sent him to Tantak Singh Hospital, we sent him to NAMS for, uh, for drug addiction. He will, he, will, um, he will alternate between legal drugs and illegal drugs, legal drugs, just because the voices in, the, in his head keep telling him to do things like that. And the last in, Ju in June, the voices in, in his head again told him to take some illegal drugs and surrender himself to the police, which he did. He's now in DRC, and guess what? They gave him the same treatment. When he said he's suicidal, they chained him up to the bed again. And then when he, when he kept, he, he, was, he, was, um, he was charged in prison for failing to take his medication and hiding it. He is mentally not stable. He just wanted to, I asked him, why, yeah, why, did you hide, why did you not take your medication? Why did you hide it? He said, oh, mommy, I want to take it at night so I can sleep. I said, then you have to talk to the doctor. You can't just hide like that. So he was charged. And guess what? What was the punishment? What was the sentence? Two strokes of cane for failing to take medication and hiding his medication. One week, in, they apparently have another kind of detention cell inside. One forfeited visit from the family. We have two televisits, I mean, we have two visits with him every month. So one for fitted, he will be given a bucket of water every morning for 10 minutes. He can use it for shower. And this bucket of water, is, he's supposed to consume it also for the whole day. And blended food for his meals. I mean, I, I get very, very emotional if I go into the details. So I'm not going to do it here. And I'll start crying. So what I, what, what, I, what I would suggest is, if you're interested to what happened, I don't believe that we are, uh, we, we, we are an isolated case. I believe there are many out there that have, been, that have gone through tremendous and great suffering. So I urge you, if you're interested, just go to my website and talk about it. Because I, I really don't want to cry again. Thank you so much. Yeah, another, another note is, and because of this, my health has greatly deteriorated. I'm now suffering from, I was suffering from very, very deep depression. I went to see two psychiatrists, one psychologist. Uh, I went to see my uh, MP, Dr. Tio. I went to see social worker. I spoke to every single person I could speak to, and my tears has actually run dry. I, I had a big breakdown when I was in IMH because Ian's doctor refused to see me to talk about Ian. Anyway, so um, I'm not able to work for the last five years or more, and we have I, totally depleted of funds to help Ian and myself. We have, once he's out from DRC, um, I'm urging the authorities to let him out early so that we can bring him for alternative medical treatment because what uh, the pharmaceuticals in Singapore, I mean, we, they, they cannot help him. So we are going for alternate therapy, like a yoga, like forest therapy, you know, to be near nature. Because people like that, they need, they need to be with nature. Plant some plants, be with the greens, and then be with the river, the mountains. This, and meditation also, because meditation has helped me a lot. So I believe it will help Ian too. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, Karina, a big hand for her. Yeah, I just want to ask Karina a few questions. Yeah, how do you think the authorities can handle your son better, especially while he's going through national service? Uh, no, he's, uh, he's been discharged. So when he was discharged uh, in 2015, uh, we have to send him to IMH and Tantasin Hospital. And finally, they diagnosed him as schizo. So I'm just hoping that uh, PM Lee and uh, the rest of the ministries that I have addressed this to can respond because they are ignoring my letters. They're not responding. I've been writing and writing. I will post all my letters, most of it, in fact, on my Facebook page, and you can see from the beginning to the end. Two, I started writing in 2012 until like two months ago. No reply, or they just ignore. So I also heard that you have written to CPA board to request for funds from your ordinary account to treat your son. 
So how, how, how has that been all along? Oh, they stick to their rules that um, they will not release it and I have to keep it for my retirement, which I find it very strange because um, what is more important now is to make sure that life is sustainable now. Life is not sustainable now because I'm not working, my funds are depleted. I need money to help my son to go for alternative healing. So they are not, they, I mean, to me, it's, it's very simple. It's just pure common sense, right? If my house is on fire right now, I do not ration water for future use. That's exactly what they are doing. They're asking me to do. Ration for future use. Yeah, ration for future use. Uh, like uh, most of these this people in this, in this ministry is from the lowest help position to the highest. They don't have common sense. When you read my letter, you will know. Maybe I'll just briefly read to you the first, the first uh, page. Oh, no, no. Too long. <laughs> Too long. <laughs> uh, maybe just a few minutes. Huh? Give a hand, Karina. A very brave and very respectable mother. When she told me she wanted to speak, I actually told her, yeah, you should. You should actually let your voices be heard. I think a lot of you have differences, but let us be more brave. Let us be a Karina who dare to come up to speak, right? As all speakers, right, she has a chance to wave the national flag with me. Give her a hand, Singapore, Karina. Yeah, let's leave this high. We are Singapore, Singaporeans first. Singapore for Singaporeans. Thank you, Karina. Right, thank you very much. Yeah, I know a lot of you have given us, right? Every day I receive emails from you, but I guess sometimes when the stage is set, you have to have the courage to speak out. Because this is the right time, you know. Right, the press are here, you know, there are two cameramen here. Probably even uh, I see Channel News Asia is here. So this is the right time for you to speak out. Right, you can write to PMO, you can write to ministers, you can write to MP, but sometimes they don't reply you. But in this kind of staging, you must be daring. You must be courageous to speak out. So for the sake of Karina, for the sake of his son, Ian, right, I really salute her. Are we ready to shout our slogan again, Singapore? Say no! Say no! To Sika! To Sika! Say no! To 6.9! Say no to PAP. <laughs> yeah, that one, the last one cannot tahan. Uh. I must say something. Uh. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say. Right. Actually, there's a speaker here, Kwan. He actually wanted to say something. But when he applies for the permit just now, he couldn't get it. Because I think he applied too late. But Kwan, you know, right? It's a gifted speaker. It's a walking encyclopedia. He said, Gilbert, no lah, I don't have permit, no. If I speak, uh, where the MPARCs will get me, the police will get me. But I think, should we not, should we hear from him, Singapore? Right, five minutes from Kwan Yu Keng. Gilbert Sabo me lah. Actually, I would have applied for the permit in time. I, I, I've always uh, been uh, helping my friend here, so, but uh, I, I was down with flu, so I was thinking whether shall I come and uh, make a speech, so I will not make a speech because they did not approve my permit, uh, all right? So, yeah, I wish, uh, but can you pay the fine for me? <laughs> okay, so I will refrain from speaking, okay? Thank you very much, Gilbert. I mean, thank you for your trust and faith in me, all right? I would uh, address you on another occasion. Thank you very much. All right, but keep on fighting. Okay, I wave. I wave the flag with a uh, Say no to Sika. Say no to six point nine. Say no to PAP. Thank you. Yeah, the last one actually cannot say lah. But anyway, <laughs> we we just say lah. Yeah la. I think you know election is coming ah, uh. right? So uh, I think they'll let us off, right? Yeah, there's a, a, a fourth speaker, right? I don't know whether he's here or not. Is Francis still here? Francis still. 
Wow, he's not here. Yeah, he's a cardboard collector. He's supposed to speak. Actually, I have to admit to you, out, out of eight speakers that we have, three have back off. Right, I think people are scared. Right, but I salute you. I salute those who are speaking, right? They are not scared, right? To those who come forward to speak, let's give them another hand. Right, let's give them another hand. Yeah, out of eight of you, three have dropped off. Right, I don't know why. Maybe something happened. Right, so it's not a good sign, right? We should not be afraid. I think one of the main problems of Singaporeans is we are very fearful. Even coming to here, we are scared. Am I right? Coming to here, your wife will say, hey, wow, today you go to Hongling Park. You go to uh, Gilbert's event. Wow, wait, the ISD come and knock at the door. Right, wait, the police will come. Wait, your boss will come. So I don't know. I think something is not right. No? This is a legitimate place, a legal place. We have a permit to meet here. So there's nothing to fear. But I know, I know it's a very suppressed country. It's a very suppressed uh, system. Many people have been sued. A lot of the activists that spoke here were been sued by the Prime Minister, by the police, by the authorities. But I think we should not let this fear suppress us. Because the only thing that can bring us out of misery is courage. The only thing that can bring us out of this misery is our courage. We need to stay brave, Singapore. We cannot let the authorities, the system suppress us. Look at Hong Kong. Look at Chile. Look at Lebanon. People are rising in the street. I just heard Lebanon Prime Minister has stepped down because the people has taken to the streets. But we can't. Right. I'm not saying you go to the street and protest. Right. This is not right. But we should not let fear hinder us. Right. We should not let fear suppress us. We should not let fear make us do the right thing. This is nothing wrong. Right. Going against the system in a legitimate way is nothing wrong. Right. We are not creating riots. We are not uh, burning down Hongling Park. We are not marching. Right, this is a legitimate place. So tell your friends, tell your families, if we have an event, we should come. There are about eight to 900 of you here. Give yourself a hand, Singapore. Eight to 900 of you here. Right, I'm very proud of you. This is a very, very sensitive event, right? There's some race issue involved. As Siva has said, a lot of uh, misinformation is going around. Right, a lot of lies has been going around. I've been branded as anti-Indian racist, that I don't like Indian. The whole thing is about race. But you know, it is not. We talk a lot about Sika, about employment, right? about issues that affect our sons and daughters. If you don't fight for your next generation, who will? Our daughter, who is now living in Sydney, Sad to say she's not coming back. I say, Joyce Lynn, this is your country, you know. But she say, Daddy, there's no future in this country. I tend to agree with my daughter. She's 25. She has a master's from Uni of Sydney. I told her, maybe you did the right thing by not coming back. I actually wanted her to come back. I felt that, you know, there's something here, all right? Singapore is still not so bad. But after five years, six years, seven years of being away, I felt maybe my daughter has made the right decision not to come back. Right. So now she's staying there. She's not coming back. I visited her recently, and she's happy. She's working, but in a part-time basis, in a very, very good, uh, well-paying job, which she will never get in Singapore. The taxes are high there, mind you, 35%, 38%, but the wages are high too. Right, you earn six to eight thousand a month. After taxes, you still take back about four to five thousand. This is not bad, right? Considering that she's a fresh grad. Am I right? Wow. Okay, you're so quiet. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, one more speakers. Right. Uh, is well known, right, in this uh, Hominim Park, right. Someone whom I respect. I think he has spoken about 10 times, right, Mr. Tan. 10 to 15 times. 
Recently, he made something that um, I don't know. I don't know, sad or or very uncomfortable. He said he's not standing for election because his wife has uh, given him some pressure. It does happen, you know. If there is someone in the family that is doing politics, sometimes right, there's resistance. Right, the family is not very comfortable, especially the wife. Right, I don't know whether truly it will affect the daughters, right, uh, career prospect, etc. But I guess he's the man to say about all this, right, Mr. Tan Kin Lian. Uh, since a few speakers have uh, opted not to speak, I shall grab some of their time. Is that all right? So uh, don't stop me after five minutes. Huh? Uh, let me have a little bit more time. Is it okay, uh, Gilbert? All right, thank you. Now, I will not take Gilbert's advice about not mentioning the name Ramesh. Uh, there is uh, nothing... Uh, Wrong with mentioning him, it is a fact. I watched the video of Ramesh scolding, abusing, and belittling the security officer in his, con in his condominium. I find his behavior to be arrogant, Abusive, deplorable. Do you agree? Yeah. I see a foreigner who came to Singapore to get a well-paid job bullying a local who earned perhaps less than one-tenth of his salary and who has to work 12 hours a day just to make a living. That's what I see. A ministerial statement from Home Affairs said, Ramesh is a Singapore citizen. It does not make any difference to me because Ramesh did not serve national service. Why should we have citizens being granted to young people who did not serve national service? I cannot understand why he can take a high-paying job in the bank when there are many well-educated Singaporeans who have worked many years in the financial services industry. Why can't this well-paying job be filled by a Singaporean? one who has served national service. I know that many Singaporeans are also very angry. They went into social media to vent their anger. They used strong words strong language, make abusive personal attack. I'm sorry to say I don't agree with this behavior either. What we write in the social media, what we write in the social media, the words we use are read by Many people, foreigners and, local, and Singaporeans, in and out of Singapore, 
we don't want to give an impression that Singaporeans are bigots, racist, or unreasonable people. I hope you will agree with me. So let us be, put our anger properly and do not damage the reputation of Singaporeans. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. A friend approached me to sign a petition. We want Ramesh to be sacked from his job. We want Ramesh to be expelled from Singapore. I'm sorry to say, I declined to sign the petition. And I want to tell you why. If Ramesh, if this behavior is shown by a Singaporean, and there are many Singaporeans with bad behavior as well. Do we also expect the Singaporeans to be expelled, to lose a job? Now, as sensible people, we must be more balanced. Uh, we must be fairer. So I declined politely to sign the petition. I know many of you did. I don't judge you. Maybe you are more angry than me. But we must also remember that we have to treat everybody, locals and foreigners, those in Singapore, we have to treat them fairly. I told my friend I will wait for Ramesh to apologize. Well, Ramesh did apologize. He apologized several times, and I read that Stephen had accepted his apology. I believe Ramesh's apology to be sincere, I believe, I believe he has learned his lesson. And in the spirit, in the spirit of generosity and goodwill, I call on Ramesh to withdraw his police report. And I hope that he will listen to my advice and close this matter. I am still very angry. I am not angry now at Ramesh. He has apologized. I am angry at the, P at the government. I am angry at the PAP government. I'm angry at national service. It requires our male citizens to serve two years full time and they are paid a very small allowance. Peanuts are okay. Peanuts is 600,000. We don't even get peanuts. So we require our male citizens to serve two years at a very miserable allowance. This means that our male citizen come into the workforce two years later and they have to compete with foreigners like Ramesh for jobs. And if you have two years less experience, I tell you, it's hard to get a job. 
I also don't like 10 years of reservist duty. Male citizens have to do 10 years of reservist duty. And you know what happened? Employers prefer foreign workers. Foreign workers do not have to serve reservist duty. They do not have to have their work schedule disrupted. And this is one reason why our local males find it difficult to get jobs compared with foreigners. When National Service started in the 1960s, Singapore was a poor country. Singapore was a weak country militarily. I supported National Service. Most Singaporeans think the same. We all supported National Service in the early days. Do you agree? 50 years have passed. Singapore is no longer a poor country. Why are we still expecting our male citizens to serve national service and get a miserable allowance? Why can't we pay them a proper salary? They need this for their future. Do you agree? I think Lee Hsien Loong is too far away. He can't hear. Do you agree? I also find not necessary to take two years because other countries, those with conscription, do it for a shorter time. It's possible to train our citizens without taking two years of their time. I also find 10 years reservist too long, unnecessary. We can make it shorter. And if we had reduced reservist duty to three or five years, our dear Aloysius Pang would be still here with us today. How can you expect our male citizens who have got demands of their job, who has to start a family, you pull them from their job and their family, you send them to New Zealand, and you put them in live firing exercise, mistakes will happen, accidents will happen. We should stop this. So I call the government to review the national service policy. 2019, 50 years have passed. Times have changed. We have different challenges. We cannot continue to disadvantage our male citizens in this way. You have also read about footballer Ben Davis. Is it the right name? You have also heard about Joseph Schooling, the national swimmer. We need our national service policy to be fairer to locals. We don't want to destroy their sporting and their artistic careers. We have to be more flexible. (laughs) 
I am also angry at the Ministry of Manpower. Why is the Ministry giving so many employment passes? And some of them, you, we all know, based on fake degrees, and based upon degrees from questionable universities. Why can't we impose a levy on employment pass holders? We already impose a levy on lower levels as pass work permit. Why should employment pass holders be free from levy? Oh, they are foreign talents. Bullshit! Why should foreign, foreigners get good paying jobs at the expense of our locals who have to serve national service? Why can't the ministry scrutinize the applications more carefully and disallow fake and dubious degrees? I am told some employers prefer foreigners. The foreigners coming to work in Singapore have to pay a high fee to the employment agent. Three, six months salary. I am told some employment agents give kickbacks. With this kind of rubbish system, our poor Singaporeans will find it very hard to get jobs. I'm also very angry at Sika, the call The Cooperative Economic Cooperation Agreement signed between Singapore and India. I believe Ramesh comes into Singapore under SICA. Hey, if you, keep, if you keep on interrupting me, my 20 minutes is not enough, okay? I believe that Ramesh comes into Singapore under Sika, but it is not only Ramesh. Oh, there must be 50,000, 100,000 or more. The foreigners who come in freely under SICA and other schemes, take over jobs that should be filled by our locals. In some cases, now they take over jobs that should be filled by locals. And if we as parents, we we find that our children can't get good jobs. We have to thank the PAP. Not only are our young people difficult to get jobs, 
even the older professionals among the locals, they lose their jobs for one reason or another. And their jobs are taken over by foreigners. Wait, wait a while, I'm trying to get this mobile phone to be upright. So the foreigners come in to take jobs that our young people cannot get. They come in to replace our older workers. Uh, and our older workers get retrenched and replaced by foreigners. When a company is a foreign-owned company, there is a tendency for the employer to take in their own countrymen. Even local companies, when they employ human resource manager who is a foreigner, the HR manager also prefer their own countrymen. Worse still, from the same village. It is widely believed that Sika has caused a lot of problems to Singaporeans in competing for good paying jobs against foreigners. How does Sika benefit Singapore? What is the quid pro quo? So far, I have not seen any convincing evidence or report from the government. Sika has been implemented for almost 15 years. Surely, the government knows that it has to be reviewed. Is it benefiting Singapore equally as it benefits India, or are we being taken for a ride? The people involved in SICA 15 years ago, many have retired but some are still in the government. I call on these people to give an account to Singaporeans and to clean up the mess they have created. A month ago, one month ago, someone spoke to me. He said, in many advanced countries, the people who drive taxis are the immigrants. The immigrants cannot find any well-paying jobs. The only way to make a living is to drive taxis. He says, Mr. Tan, why is it in Singapore taxi drivers are our locals and uh, private hire drivers are our local, while the foreigners get the good paying jobs? I cannot answer him. I don't know the answer. I have met many I've met many people 
a few years younger than me. They are in their 50s, 60s, and some in their 70s. Many of these people are here today, many of you. We belong to the generation that saw Singapore when we first became independent and we saw Singapore through the years. We were once very proud of Singapore. We were once very supportive of PAP. And these people tell me, today, they no longer support the PAP. They say, the PAP has be betrayed the people of Singapore. They have taken, they have neglected the interests of Singaporeans and they have now give preference to foreigners. I share their views. General election is around the corner. Three, six, maybe nine months. I call on voters to think of the future of our children and grandchildren. Many of us are still okay. Some of us still got jobs. We got our house. But what about the children? What about the grandchildren? So we must think about the future of our children and grandchildren. We must have the courage. We must be united. We must vote against the PAP. We cannot allow the PAP to continue their current policies that have been very bad for the people. If all thinking people, if all thinking citizens of Singapore, if we all vote against the PAP, we will be able to see a significant change. My hope is one third of parliament will go to opposition. But that requires everybody to have the courage and to vote against the PAP. Now, I say thinking people, people with eyes and people with heart. Now, some people say they want the PAP to fall totally. You have to be patient. It will take two or three general elections. So at the very best, if we are all united, one third of parliament will fall to the opposition, more than one third. There will still be many people that vote for PAP. I must, I'm sad to say, these people mostly, not everyone mostly, are selfish. 
they have jobs. So they think I'm okay. Wait until they lose their job. So, all thinking person must set aside, don't worry, we vote against the PAP. And we get more people to be on our side. So today's rally is no to Saka. Do you agree? Yeah. No to 6.9 million while the country is still in a mess. Do you agree? Yeah. No to PAP. Do you agree? Terima kasih. Sia -sia. Nandri. Thank you. Begin for Mr. Tan Kin Lin, the biggest opposition support that Singapore has. Well, it's a pity that he's not standing for election. Begin again, Tan Kin Lin. Yeah, all the speakers have a chance to wave the Singapore flag with me. Let's wave it together, Mr. Tan. No to 6.9. No to Sika. No to PAP. Thank you, Singapore. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Yeah, I have some good news. All right, we have two additional speakers. Right, they managed to get the permit. And we also have Osman here, right? He just rushed down. So we have three more speakers. Is it okay? You can stay until seven. Can okay, uh? Seven o'clock, Bule. Uh? Yeah, at seven, we have to stop because the permit ceases at seven. And after seven, there'll be a press conference. Right? If you're from the press, right, please stay behind. All the speakers will be here to answer your questions. Right, the next speaker is someone that impresses me a lot. He has a video speech that actually crosses 200,000 views. Mr. Simon Lim. Yeah, both of them have just got their permit approved thanks to NPAX. Give a hand to NPAX. Right. Well, both of us got our permit via our handphone. It just came in 20 seconds ago. So now I'm happy to have a chance to address you. Same as for Simon. Good afternoon, friends. I am greatly heartened to see so many of you here. Thank you very much. Now, I feel very strongly about Sika and the 6.9 million population because I love my country like every one of you and I care. That's why I'm here and that's why you are here. Now, SICA is short for Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement that was signed between India and Singapore in 2005. The whole discussion started in two, about 2003, uh, but it was concluded, finally concluded in 2005. Now, under SICA, under SICA, among many other things. 
It is not just intra-corporate transfer. It is not that, that. Or enabling our sovereign wealth funds to invest in Indian companies. No, it's not just that only. It is a lot more. Like, for example, the avoidance of two-way, double taxation. But today, I will only touch on what concerns every one of us, and that is intra-corporate transfer. When the Singapore government approached India government to allow our sovereign wealth fund to invest in India, there were certain legal uh, hindrance that you know this allowed that. So in order to make it easier, you get what you want. Singapore government to Masi holding, you get what you want, and they get what they want. There was a a series of discussions. And so what happened was that we allow 127 professions. These are not workers. Huh? These are not Bangladeshi workers or maids. These are people wearing long sleeve coat, putting on tie, going to work. These are the employment pass holders and the S pass holders. Employment pass holders are people who are able to bring their families to Singapore. You follow so far? So in other words, in other words, the government has shortchanged Singaporeans. We have surrendered a lot of our good jobs, well-paying jobs to the Indians in order for Tomasid to invest in the Indian companies such as uh, ICICI or Bank or Reliance or maybe even Tata, big Indian companies. So after close to 15 years, what do we get? After close to 15 years, we look at Tomasid. Their returns were not impressive at all. Then we look at our people. What do we get? A lot of our people were displaced, replaced, ended up as Grab taxi drivers. It's very, very sad, you know. If you know personal friends, it is very, very very sad. All their education, all their experiences, all their contacts, many other things have gone to waste that they could have otherwise you know, add value to our economy. So that is Sika in short. An intra-corporate transfer, what is that? For example, India can send corporate, nah? in, intra, 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 just like intranet, nah? intra, within the organizations, they can send their professionals from India to Singapore. And who will follow? Their families will follow. So I think Singaporean, even if you go for interview, the changes are quite obvious. Okay. I think we have been short short change, betray. I will I use my words very carefully. I think we have been short changed a great deal by the PAP because of their greed. Greed has blinded them. Greed has blinded them and they don't have the courage to admit to the people. And as a process our people have been shortchanged a great deal. I think that is very bad. Any Singaporeans who disagree are Singaporeans who are either stubborn, blind, stupid. And that kind of stupidity is stupidity of the highest level. Huh? Hard to find anywhere in the world. Now, I will talk a little bit. I have other, another two more speakers. I will not take too much of their time. I will talk a little bit about the 6.9 million Singaporeans. If we are not able, if the government is not able to create better employment opportunities for our people, despite decent educations that we have, English-speaking, worldwide, 
IT literate and everything. So you just go for the easy way, and the easy way is labor. Just import more people. What happened? Think further, 10, 20 years, 30 years down the road. These people, foreigners coming to Singapore, they don't come here to make babies for you Singaporean. They come here to earn money. And if they stay unmarried, they will only add on to our total fertility rate and our old age problem. They will only compound our problem. Then what happened? Then their, then their baby become our baby. Now we are looking after our parents, our in-laws. Going forward, our children will have to look after their parents, their in-law, and also foreigners who are already old in Singapore. This is a damn stupid policy. We don't need, we don't need PAP generals or scholars to smoke you any further. You just need common sense, clear mind, and dare to think. And you will get to the answer. That's all. Because foreigners don't come here to make babies for you, no? They come here to make money. But if they stay unmarried and under-reproduce, under-replace themselves, then when they owe, when they are old, their problem become our problem. This is a very stupid policy of the PAP government. By then, this current generation of PAP leaders will all be retired. And then our children will have to bear very heavy burdens. So when we vote, we not only vote for ourselves, I always have a photograph of my children in front of me remind me when I cast my vote. You never go wrong. Then you will know what to do. Next. Lastly, last two, three minutes. I say no to 6.9 million. Not because I am xenophobic. No. I say no because we are already a very dense society. We are a very small place. Never bite off more than you can chew. Otherwise, you will choke to death. Because, because with 6.9, what will happen is that cost of living will go up. Stress level will go up. Livability of this place will go down. Crime will go up. A lot of bad things, tension between among people will also go up that the ministers will never encounter in their everyday life. So that let us not kid ourselves. Anything that is good for Singapore, I'm there. Anything that is bad for Singapore, I will not pretend. I will spoil out as well. I thank you very much. Yeah, let's give a hand. Simon Lim, big hand, big hand. Simon Lim. Right, we wave the flag together, okay, Singapore? Simon, like, let's shout the slogan too, together. Say no. Say no. To Siga. Say no. Say no. To 6.9. Say no. Say no. no. To PAP. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, next speaker is someone that is here for the last seven years. I think he's been with me for seven, eight years. We're here together. Remember, the stage was here. Anyone here in 2013? Anyone here in 2013 where we broke records? Where 5,000 of you are here? He's here with me, my brother, Guan Yu Kang. Give him a big hand. Oh, yes, Mr. Guan. I think I'll use this. Thank you, uh, Gilbert, once again for putting your faith in me. I hope uh, I won't let you down. And thank goodness <coughs> my speaker's permit just, as I said just now, came in. All right? On my phone. So I can speak freely. All right? Now, I've already actually prepared my speech, and uh, so it is not going to waste. Now, Let's touch on, again, uh, like my colleague Simon just now, let me touch on CCAR first. In addition to what uh, Simon has told you, I want you to think of one more point about CCAR, all right? Now, this is actually a form of free trade agreement, the movement of uh, investment between two countries except that in CCAR, 
there were special conditions. Not only was it movement of investment, all right, either way, but this was an unprecedented, never happened before, unprecedented allowance of labour from one of the partners to the other one. And today we know the consequences. After almost 13 years of implication, of application of SICA, that in that agreement, we allow Indian professionals, all right, professionals, huh? not construction workers. Construction workers, we can still get them from uh, Bangladesh, from Thailand, uh, Malaysia. But these are for professional, managerial, engineering, technical staff. This is the unprecedented. No other countries have made this kind of agreement. India has a population of how much? 1.3 billion. They have overtaken China as the most populous nation in the world. 1.3 something billion. 1% is 13 million. 0.1% is 1.3 million. 0.01% is 130,000. So even if we allow 0.001% of Indians to come in, we become Singapore. No, no more Singapore. Right? So now, why has the PAP not foresee this kind of uh, development? We have all the best brains. They claim to have all the PhDs and all the first class honours people in government. They have the best that Singapore is this what they can produce. Yeah, million dollar salary. All right. The highest paid ministers in the world. Is this what? They can come up with, all right, vote wisely, huh? vote wisely at the coming general elections. <clears throat> now, so as part of SICA, all right, all the government uh, linked companies and our sovereign wealth funds can invest in uh, a variety of Indian companies, like what Simon has said, could be Tata Industries, for example. All right. So now, after 13 years, the people in uh, Tamasic and GIC said, hey, we are not getting good returns, man. We are getting better in returns elsewhere in other parts of the world. Hey, how come we are not getting good returns from our Indian investment? So they speak to the government. And one of the reasons, all right, which now is publicly known and which they cannot deny, is that the government, the Indian government says, hey, we cannot tell these corporations what to do. Because in India, the government is not into business of running a business. They are only in the business of governing the country. Unlike Singapore, where this government is not only running a government, they are also running all the businesses. All the major businesses are in the government hands. But that's not so in India. In India, the government say, hey, Mr. Modi cannot say, hey, tell the president of Tata Industries, hey, you better allow more uh, Singaporeans to, to uh, invest, sell more shares to Singapore companies. He can't do that. So now they're stuck. But at the same time, once they stop Indian professionals from coming in, they will protest. Hey, you're not fulfilling your, 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 your uh, section, your promise of the agreement. So who is always on the losing end? You tell me. Yeah. Is this what our million dollar ministers, this kind of agreement they can come up with? Do they deserve the million dollar salary to do things like that? Now, yes, let's think about this, all right? So, 
Thank you very much. Now, go, go, go home. Speak to your colleagues. Go to your office. All right. Speak to your brothers, sisters, cousins. Speak to your colleagues. Tell them that this is what is happening in Singapore. All right. Yeah. Changi, Changi Industrial Park is known as Jinapore already. Oh. Now, back to uh, the condominium parking issue. All right. That is also uh, actually, well, I cannot mention name. All I say is the condominium parking incident. All right. This issue, all right, as what Mr. Tan said, some very concerned citizens have raised a petition on the internet asking people to, to do petition for two things, all right? To petition his citizenship to be revoked and petition his boss to sack him. And like Mr. Tan, all right, I am also angry. I am very, very angry. But, but let us be rational. Very rational. All right. Let's give him a chance. We are a big hearted people. We are a good country. We are good citizens. Give the fella a chance. Never mind. All right. We are big enough. Yeah. But a lesson must be taught. By doing so, I think the message has gone on to this guy that I think in his heart he feel shit I have done something wrong <laughs> okay all right. no the degree of remorse is different all right whether his degree of remorse is very high or very low we leave it to his conscience but we must show that we are a big hearted people all right we are forgiving enough I think we have done enough and this has provoked reaction from uh, people accusing the petition raisers as now the, this is a very strong word which was used against those people who organized the petition they use the word xeno apartheid now this is a combination of xenophobia and apartheid these are the two most racialistic description you can give a person or an organization xeno apartheid we know that apartheid does not exist anymore. That was the worst form of racialism that ever existed in the history, in the modern history of mankind. That the South African government all right, treated all the blacks as almost like slaves. Nelson Mandela was locked up for 25 years because he spoke out against apartheid. So, for some people to criticize the petition raises all right against this guy in black here <laughs> to be sacked and to be have his citizenship revoked they use that oh you guys are xeno apartheid that is a very extreme form of racialism to use so therefore i really urge my fellow singaporeans let us be big-hearted enough to let this issue die. I think, all right, with apologies, I think Ram Mesh has learned his lesson. So let us say that, but we have learned a lesson that this is uh, one of the consequences of our liberal foreign talent policy. They say that uh, this guy in black is already a citizen, so we shouldn't uh, hit him too hard. But he came here about 10 years ago. Definitely it was under uh, Sika policies, because Sika policies was, well, 15, 13 years ago. So he must have uh, got his uh, work permit, all right, because of his uh, qualifications and so on and so forth. All right, that was a SICA policy. So now, which brings me all right, to, to the last point. All right, Gilbert, my last point. I know uh, 
we still have some more speakers. The last point I want to make, rising out of this issue, a combination of Sika and 6.9 million population. With the ever-increasing population that is brought into Singapore, the question we Singaporeans must ask ourselves is, shall we accommodate ourselves to their culture or they should accommodate themselves to Singapore? Right? Shouldn't it be they accept what we practice here, what we believe here, and the things we do here, rather than the other way around? We have to uh, follow uh, all these foreigners who are so exclusive, all right? They stick to themselves. In fact, enclaves are being formed and they expect we Singaporeans to behave as they do. This is ridiculous, this is nonsense. They should be uh, adopting our culture. They should pledge loyalty, we the citizens of Singapore, not we the citizens of India. Do we see the sentiments arising out of all these? Now, I'm not just talking of the Indian community because we mentioned Sika. There are so many of other races, Asian races being brought in, all right? For example, the Filipinos, the mainland Chinese, and also Malaysians. Shouldn't they all learn to accept Singapore as now their home? and behave towards Singapore like we do, right? Thank you very much. Hey Gilbert, I have already waved the flag. You want me to wave one more time? Shall I wave one more time? Yeah, it's okay, we wave one more time. Mr. Kwan, you can give a big hand, Mr. Kwan. Say, Say no, no to Sika. Say, Say no, no to 6.9. Say, Say, no no Say no to, to PAP. PAP. <laughs> yeah, always a pleasure to hear Mr. Kwan, right? He's a walking encyclopedia. Everything he has is in his head. Yeah, I'm happy he can get the permit last minute. There are two more speakers, right? But before that, I actually wanted to do a poster design contest, right? There are actually three ang pao for you, but actually not many of you. Who who has carried a poster here? Can I see? There's one more here. Can we ask the lady to come forward, right? Give her a hand, right? Give her a hand. Yeah, we want to acknowledge those who carry posters. Because we want this to be a future trend of all our events here. Give her a hand, come here. Right. Oh, Lee Sien Yen. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you come to the stage? Come, come. Don't be afraid. Yeah, yeah. Come. I think there's one uh, gentleman here, so, who uh, has get, get uh, posters here. Right. One gentleman. Right. I think it's over there, right? Oh, yeah, there's, uh, there's something there, right? Is it a poster? Oh, no, I mean uh, Karina. I think Karina can come up. Give Karina a hand again, the speaker, right? Because she did a very good poster. Actually, yesterday she asked me, hey, Gilbert, where to make a poster? So I actually give her an address in Brass Basa, right? Give her a hand, Karina. Is there one more? We have three Ang Pao for the best three designs for posters. Well, both are women. Oh my God. Where are all the men? Men, are you here with your poster? All the men. Right, is there a guy that has a poster? Because we have an bow for you. Because there are two ladies here. Right, anyone with a poster? Yeah, I'm going to ask them, right, what the posters men. Is it okay? Yeah, uh, I want to ask this. Uh, yeah, what does the poster say? And why do you make it? Oh, it carries the theme for today. 
no to Zika, no to the, the explosive population, and also no to all the price hikes, the fares, the GST, the taxes. And I have, it's no to oppression, to all the, read for yourself, okay? I have it here. Why are you so angry? I have suffered too much and I've seen people around me suffering. Needlessly, bullet in the office, bullet everywhere, insulted. And they're so inconsiderate even in the public areas. They, they are so, well, so badly brought up. And they demand that we follow them. It's stupid. I've never seen the government so stupid before. Okay, okay. Uh, really a very, very angry women. But give a hand for our bravery, right? For our creativity in doing a posters for us. I'm going to ask uh, Karina Sola because she was asking me yesterday, right? How to do the posters? But I just want to ask her, yeah, how did she get it done? How much does it cost? And does it bring out the relevant message? Yeah, um, it cost me fifteen dollars Singapore. Singapore fifteen dollars to get this done, both sides. And I have to put a plastic over it just in case it rain because my bargain with him is rain or shine will be here and um, yeah most importantly is to get my voice heard by my uh, government by uh, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long and by all the ministries from the lowest to the highest they have been like zombies they have been like monsters because they have not heard us for so long, we have been crying and wailing in pain a hundred thousand times in the last seven plus years. So that's why today I'm here to speak up. I have been very quiet. I have write, I have, I've written again and again, again, pleading with them, crying, crying, crying. Every time I see the social worker, I'm in, I was in tears. That's why today I promised myself that I will not cry again. It's enough. It's, it, my, my heart is totally broken. And then one more, one more thing I want to add. Uh, because I went to see Dr. Chiu Ho Pin, he has helped return to uh, Singapore prison, and they have lifted the two caning, but Yen, is, Yen still had to go through the punishment, which he did because I went to see him two days ago. He was in the cell for one week, um, had blended food, uh, forfeited one family visit. Okay, big hand for Karina, the loving mother to two sons, right? Should we give them a present, right, for what they have tried? I think there's a gentleman there, right? Behind, uh, that one, yeah, there's one more. Can you come forward, this, this gentleman here with the tie? Because we are having a poster design contest, and we have three Ang Pao for you. Right, give him a hand, right, what's your name, sir? What's your name, sir? Mr. Kwan, yeah, Mr. Kwan, okay. Yeah, you have to come uh, for, but, for, uh, by the bench, yeah? Yeah, by the stairs. Yeah. <laughs> so we, give him a hand, right, Mr. Kwan. Right, yeah. D can you tell us a bit what does a poster say? Um, uh, I'm looking for a wife. Oh, my God. Oh, no. But why? This is the, not the matchmaking. Uh. <laughs> Actually, uh, I supposed to join the Singapore Development Network, SDN. So the government uh, save money, go and cancel the organization, upsold to the private one. So it's very costly and uh, they only allow 2, 20, 30 and they select the good one. So I every time got no chance to participate. Okay, now we have two lovely women here for you to, to choose. <laughs> yeah, we will give him an angpao uh, for his bravery and his courage. I'm right? also looking for a wife. No? <laughs> Yeah, shall we? Uh, I think Mr. Lim Tian is here. Lim Tian? Yeah, uh, it's Mr. Lim Tian here. Yeah, we want Lim Tian to come forward. To, oh, I think he's uh, gone. Mr. Lim Tian, are you here? Yeah, we want you to give away the Ang Pao. Lim Tian, come. We want you to give away the Ang Pao and say a few words. Uh. Shall we hear from Lim Tian? Yeah, very good speaker. But first... We want Lim Tian to give away the Ang Pao to these three posters contestants. <laughs> yeah, we want you to give away the Ang Pao. 
to this wife get wife such a <laughs> yeah thank you and also for Karina yeah what's your name what's your name Del yeah uh, Del yeah Yeah, thanks to all the posters, contestants. We also want to give a hand to Lim Tien, right? To say a few words. A few words, a few words. Lim Tien! Lim Tien! Lim Tien! Gilbert, thank you. Uh, this is uh, unexpected. I, I am not a scheduled speaker, but it is wonderful to see so many of you at Hong Lim Park today. And this morning, I put up a poster on my Facebook asking people to come. And uh, I thank all of you for, you know, uh, obliging me. But this is a very important topic. Seika and the 6.9 million population. It is not even 6.9 million population now. It is 10 million. You know, the, the preordained next... PAP leader, when he opened his mouth, the first two sentences he said was, yes, to a 10 million population, and he was endorsing what Liu Taika was saying, and secondly, that Singaporeans must welcome foreigners, and that we must integrate with them. I think, I think he's got the order the other way around, don't you think? And when this Ramesh incident happened a week ago, I made a post which was very well received. And what occurred to me then was this. You know, I was a student in England in 1985 to 1991. And in 1986, around 1986, 1987, there was a very famous incident in Britain. This city, just outside of Manchester called Bradford. It has got a huge Asian community, mainly from the Indian subcontinent. And they started agitating for their community schools to teach in Urdu. And they started agitating for subjects to be taught in the schools which they say which they said would respect their cultural identity. And you know who was the British Prime Minister in those days? It was the Iron Lady Margaret Thatcher. And I never forgot what she said. She got up and she told these people, you have chosen on your own free will to come into this country to live. And you, we expect you to learn English and you better adopt the English way of life. And I think it is not unreasonable when we expect foreigners who come to live and settle and work in our country to respect our ways of life and to adopt our way of life. And it is not the other way around. All right, so I tell the PAP, it's not the other way around. All right? You better start respecting Singapore citizens first before you tell us to respect others. And I have been talking about our crazy immigration policies now for four years. Crazy. It is a crazy policy. You know, in the 1980s, which I always think of as Singapore's golden era, because that was when we really developed and, you know, uh, we became richer and we were the envy of uh, Asia. Um, Singaporeans had lots of jobs, lots of jobs. And it saddens me today when I read about all the instances of PMETs losing jobs to foreigners. Not, not only is the immigration policy crazy, 
but the labor policies are crazy as well. All right, the labor policies are crazy. And the worst thing is, the PAP have a thing called the Fair Consideration Framework for Employment. But do you know, do you know that SECA is not even subject to the Fair Consideration Framework? All right, I have said enough. Supposed to be only a few words, but thank you very much. Lim Tian, let's wave the flag together. Lim Tian, come. Say no. To Sika. Say no. To 6.9. Say no. To PAP. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Lim. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much, right, Mr. Lim. Right, support this party, huh? uh, People's Voice. Right, we have two more speakers. The next speaker is Kelvin Lin. Right, whenever I read his post, I feel very encouraged because he is one of us. Right, he is someone that I respected. Someone who say, yes, Gilbert, I want to speak. I actually approached him through a message. So he said, yeah, I want to speak. But can I speak after six? I said, wow, how come I must speak after six? Eh? So late, one. He was saying... His daughter is coming to hear him speak. Where's your daughter, Kelvin? Yeah, can your daughter and you come forward? Come, come. Don't be shy. We are all Singaporeans. Give them a hand. Kelvin and the daughter. I like whole family to come together. The father speaking for the daughter. Daughter feeling very proud because the father speak up for the next generation. Come forward. Come. Right. Give them a hand. Kelvin and daughter. Yeah, come. Yeah, I feel very proud. I really, really wish you know, my daughter is here with me. It's a very proud moment for a father to see, you know, your daughter standing together with you, right? Maybe, just maybe, I want to ask the daughter how she feel about his father speaking and getting into politics. I feel like he cares about me a lot when he talks about politics because he wants to make my generation better for me and for the people like younger than us and he doesn't just care about himself but the younger generation as well. The best speech so far. Let's give them a hand, Singaporeans. Right, these are the young people that we want to see because whenever we are here in Hongling Park, we see those above 50. 60s, 70s, there are not many young people. So I'm very proud to see Kelvin and daughter here. Give them a big hand. Kelvin and daughter. Kelvin, all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have known uh, Gilbert for some time. It's because of Facebook. Uh, and I know a lot of people here through the Facebook. Okay? I, uh, I'm a part time Grab driver. Okay, and this grab driving has uh, allowed me to uh, feed my family. Okay, at the same time, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm building something up in Thailand. Okay. Okay. Today, I want to discuss with you how Sika and how many Singaporeans' life was destroyed by it. Sika is an agreement between India and Singapore. This agreement allows India to bring in personnel and their families to work and stay in Singapore. And we cannot chase them out. Because it's an agreement. The Singapore government has just signed a deal to bring in 60,000 India professionals from India in 2011, okay? Many of us have been replaced by the professionals and this is what I'm very angry about, okay? They also intend to bring in pilots to replace our own pilots in Singapore Airlines. They also intend to bring in large numbers of nurses, Indian nurses from India, okay? And India is well known for its faith certificate and degrees, fake certificates, okay? And, and if half of them, uh, if all of them were to go for the real screening, I think half of Singapore will be free from all Indians, all will be sent back, okay? 
but our government close one eye. You think the government don't know? They know. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. And who are we to employ them? One day Singapore will be known as a country that has a lot of fake degrees and certificates because we employ this person. Okay. okay. The HR in most of this country employ their own race and deprive Singaporeans of their jobs and they classify Singapore as lazy, don't want to work, and they have no choice but to employ Singapore foreigners. I was as, uh, once I asked a HR manager who told me that no Singaporeans are willing to take up her job offer for poly graduates. I asked her, what is she paying them? She said, $1,500. I told her $1,500, and after CPF, the guy has barely enough to live. Okay? She told me at her time, when she was starting uh, about 15 years ago, she was getting the same pay, 1500 and yet she can survive. I told her about 15 years ago, and now cannot be compared. Okay, 15 years ago, the things are cheaper. Okay, they cannot be compared. And she told me that the foreigners are willing to work for a low pay. I told her that foreigners can, and after working for a few years, they can afford to buy land and house, whereas in Singapore, you cannot afford it. Okay, another Singaporean have told me that who works in the retail industry, she said her company employed more than 70% of the same race. And they celebrate their own National Day in their office. Okay? Singaporeans... Singaporeans are forced to work on weekends and public holidays, okay? And many of them are, have quit after some time. Uh, the whole process of employing, hiring foreigners goes again, okay? They tell the MOM, oh, we can't get any Singaporeans. Singaporeans need to work, okay? It's because they bully Singaporeans. Okay. Sika has caused a lot of hardship to Singaporeans. Many PMETs were retrenched even as young as 40 years old. Okay? They were unable to find the jobs that they were trained for. And in the last resort, they switched to driving taxis, grab, or become security guard. Okay? Because they have a family to feed, and many become very depressed. They have to work long hours to feed their family. Okay, what if India decide to let one million people come with the blessing of our government? Jialat, yes, right. Okay, what is going to happen? We are promised by the PAP we are going to reach 10 million people. The quota is not 6.9, it's going to reach 10 million people. All Indian. Okay, that is their aim and their target. Are we going to accept this? If the answer is no, then vote for the opposition. Okay. Many times people will compare other countries such as India and see how lucky we are. But then we, when we want to compare, we must compare Singapore 20 years ago and now. Has our life become better? It become worse under Lee Sen Lung. Yes, for the past 15 years, we are not going anywhere. Okay? Okay, 20 years ago, things were much cheaper, and we can buy many things with $50. Now, $50 is not enough to take a taxi to Woodlands and back. Okay? Ask ourselves, how does a couple the, to spend $50 just to and fro? They get no money for makan. They have no money to see the show. Okay? Now, how do you expect our young to have babies? 
and have their own home. Is the PAP going to do something about it? <laughs> okay, we don't, we don't just talk. We want to see real improvement. I remember what Dr. Chi said a couple of weeks ago. He said, it's not what you say. It is what you do. Many times, PAP had said something and then they do another thing. They said that they will not increase taxes and then they start to increase tax. Water by 30%. The car park, ERP, town council rates, cashew, electricity, and so many things. Okay? They even told us they will increase GST to 9%. Okay, that's what they said they will, and they will increase. And not only that, the anti-climate is going to cost us US, uh, cost us $100 billion. Who is going to pay for that? It's only taxes from you and me. Okay? Now, we have a very good opposition. Okay? We have a very good opposition with Mr. Tan Cheng Bo leading the PSP team. A man who could have retired but chose to stand against the PAP because he wanted to do what is right and fight against the wrong. And he has a very strong team with him. Now, for Workers' Party led by Pritang Singh, who is working very hard despite the PAP trying their best to put them out of business. With Mr. Lo Tia Kiang and Silver Lin, they are determined to fight the wrong that the PAP until the end. Even the CI, CPIB has got no case against them. Let's support them in these hard times. Dr. Chi Sun Juan leading the CNCP, he was a very determined man who has shown us what determination is all about. For most people, they will surrender to the PAP when they got sued for bankruptcy. But he stood firm and is still with us now. He's a brave and determined man and Singapore is glad to have him. And I would say that he's a different man and that he's determined to save Singapore. Okay, Tiong Lin, a lawyer who has led the people voice, has been advocating for the rights of the people who have been trampled by the PAP, a voice that has no fear against the PAP. I supported this opposition team, and I hope they will be able to form a coalition party against the PAP. 54 years is a long time, and it's time for the PAP to leave. it is time for the people to vote against the PAP. Yeah. Lee Kuan Yew once said, if the PAP has declined in quality, then the opposition has put up a team which is equal or better than the PAP. Then the people should vote for the opposition. Yeah. With this, I end my speech. Thank you. Kevin Lin. Give him a hand, big hand for Kelvin. Right, on this juncture, we also want to ask the daughter to come uh, to the stage right now. Right, come, don't be afraid. Right, you must feel proud of your father. Come, come, come. Oh, yeah, and so I think there's an eldest daughter here. Can you come also? There's two daughters, oh. I thought there's only one. Come, come. I, I'm very proud, like Kelvin, oh, to have two daughters here, you know, hearing how the father speaks. I want to ask them uh, how they feel about the father's, you know, what's the speech? How they feel about their speech? First, uh, this is, what's the name? Sheena. Sheena? Yeah, how do you feel about, you know, what your father says? Uh, honestly, honestly, um, my dad gets a lot of uh, judgment. Uh, I mean, <laughs> many of these speakers do, uh, but he is always has his eyes on uh, the family. Yeah, I remember he, the last text that he texted the family was that um, I don't want my children to one day 
come up to me and said, why do you remain silent when you could have spoken? Yeah. So, so um, he's always gangster father to me. But I've learned a lot of good things from him also. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he's not a gangster. La. He's, I think, a very loving dad. Also a very, very nice citizen of Singapore. Right, maybe the uh, younger daughter, what's Michelle, your name? Michelle. Michelle, just say something about what your father says. Right, don't be shy. La. Right, no one will catch you. Shall we hear from her, Michelle? Yes. Right, just say uh, just a few words. Yeah. Uh, I'm very proud of my father for what he's doing and the people over here that's looking out for not only your generation but the generation f after. Thank you for what you're doing and for the future. Yeah, very good. We're going to shout the slogan and wave the flag together. Is it okay, Singapore? Right, let's take some time to do this. Right. I'm going to shout and please shout after me. Say no. Say no. To. To. Sika. Sika. Say no. Say no. To. To. 6.9. 6.9. Say no. Say no. To. To. BAP. BAP. Okay, big hand for Kevin Lin and family. Right, yeah, we are very proud to have a family setting here, right? Who knows, maybe in five or even uh, earlier, you know, three years' time, they can come up to speak, the daughters. Yeah. Right, there's the last speaker, right? Someone that is a veteran, right? Has been with me for like, what, seven years, Osman? Right, I think at least ten times, ten speeches, right, or more. Right, he's very loyal. Whenever I ask him, he say, yes, Gilbert, I'll speak. Yes, Gilbert, I'll speak. So I, I always uh, have a lot of respect for him. Actually, he was texting me. He said, hey, Gilbert, maybe I cannot come, no? Because I have to send uh, someone off. But he's here. I think he has a heart for Singapore. Right, he has a heart for Singapore. Without further ado, let's give a big hand to Osman Suleiman. Good evening, Singaporeans. First, uh, I would like to introduce myself for those who don't know me. Um, I'm actually a businessman. I have a renovation company. But how it started uh, 14 years ago, in 2005, SICA uh, was actually uh, signed. So in 2005, at that time, uh, I was out of job. I was out of job and then I was looking for a job high and low. I'm armed with a diploma in business and human resource management. So what happened was, um, when, when, when all my applications got rejected or rather no answer, so I have to work as a security guard. And that is if a, a part-time job as a, uh, as a security guard. At that, mom at that time, I was a political. So I don't... I don't bother about what's happening to my country. But as time goes by, I see why am I not able to find a job? Why is this so? I have, um, uh, I have an educational certificate. So why is it even hard for me to find an admin, uh, admin assistant position? I've tried tons of uh, resume. I've even applied. And in the end, how I got my job was that I have to literally beg the manager for a position but this shouldn't happen because a job is our rights we are entitled to jobs in Singapore the government has to ensure that they are going to provide for us good jobs so as in my case in 2005 I didn't know about SICA so as time goes by I became interested in politics and then I read up on a lot of issues uh, con concerning um, uh, immigration. So what happened was that during that time, they already flooded the market uh, with foreigners taking over our jobs. And then in every department, I can see that there's always a foreigner around. So I was asking myself this question. What happened to this job position when we gave over to a foreigner? So this is one less job to our local people. So as I started to read up, then I found out about Sika. So now, what is our main beef about Sika? This Sika, it is the unfair balance of the agreement 
for how it allows professionals of 127 occupations to come to Singapore unfettered. It is called intra corporate transfers. Okay, these 127 people from India can come and work in Singapore. They don't have to go through any uh, economic or needs testing. So this means that when they, when 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 as, uh, an Indian company set up uh, their company in Singapore, so they can just transfer their employees. So what happened to jet to, to that job vacancy? While well, it should have been to our local Singaporean. So that's our main beef to Sika. I think for the rest of the Sika agreement, it generally benefit our uh, business people. Because as you can see that they can go overseas and but in this aspect, in the job, uh, in the labor aspect, how many, how many from India have actually benefited from this agreement against Singaporean going over there? Actually has our government did an assessment of how actually this clause in SICA benefit Singaporeans? I myself know that not many of us are very excited to go to, Sing, uh, to go to India. Our spouse are not excited to go to India. So who actually benefit from this agreement in SICA? Who was the one? Who was the one who implemented this? Because from our view is that only the Indians benefit. An agreement should be a win-win situation. If our people are not going there, are not going to India to benefit from any economic sense there, so why should we allow Indian people and rob Singaporeans of their jobs? So now, on top of that, on top of that, they allow their family members and spouse to come into Singapore to reside here and also look for a job. So for every spouse of the Indian nationals who came here to find a job and got a job, there is one less for us, one less for every Singaporean. Okay, so actually, last, I think last year, they did a review. Uh, they did a review uh, which was done in May and they concluded with a mutual a recognition agreement to actually facilitate but better and understanding and regulating training and practice of nursing so I understand that in Singapore um, you know uh, most of our people uh, it was narrated that uh, we do not want the nursing job we do not want the dirty job but I'm asking all these government agencies how well are you paying us Singaporeans what we can see is that those position with uh, those dirty jobs, uh, let's say a cleaner or a nursing position, all this goes to foreigners, but in the end, they are earning higher than us. Uh, this, this salary wasn't offered to us. So I personally know someone who's a foreigner, who's actually a sales assistant, or you can call it sales supervisor, a salary of about uh, $2,200. If you offer this to a Singaporean, for a sales assistant position, do you think a Singaporean would not take up? So in the end, a Singaporean was offered always the lower bottom rung of the uh, job scale. So actually, did our government do an assessment on the number of professionals who are eager to take up the advantage of this uh, agreement in India? For Singaporeans, I'm not sure, but there are many Indian nationals who are willing to come here and to reside here and to earn a lot of, uh, to earn better salaries. So, how do the government actually protect locals from jobs being robbed by us? Okay, they have the job banks. In my previous, um, in my previous workplace, I, I work as a HR executive uh, ten years prior to this. So. What I found out about Jobs Bank is that an employer is allowed to uh, post a job advertisement, but they are also allowed to include emails in their job advertisement. So this sidestep by including an email in the job advertisement, so foreigners can still apply, and this job bank 
is accessible to everyone. So I wrote a letter to MOM twice. I told them that by including emails in the job advertisement, so what employer can do is that they will wait out for the 14 days requirement period and then they sieve out all application. In the end, the, the process to employ Singaporean first uh, is counterproductive because after all, uh, after all, the foreigners also can apply. So I wrote to MOM, but then it, it wasn't replied. My email, uh, they don't reply to my email. So I think before the government has the means to control the influx of foreigners, to control uh, our job um, going out to foreigners, but they are not doing a lot to protect local Singaporean first. So now, what happened is that what happened is that our university graduate, our diploma holders are resorted, like I say, to driving grab drivers or to become a security guard. What implication this has to our labor market is that we are not harnessing our full potential. So every time when we ask the government for answers, they have been very, very opaque. They, they, they don't answer to to whatever uh, to, to, to whatever that we are asking. So we must let this government know that if they are not going to protect us, if they are not going to advance our consideration first, we are going to vote out them. We are going to vote them out. As you know, as you know that general election is coming. So how do we register our unhappiness? It's the only way I feel is through the ballot box. Because this government is a reactive government. They are not proactive to protect our interests. If they are not willing to do that, let another government take over. And make our unhappiness known to them. If we are going to vote for the next government, ensure that they have us in their thoughts first. If not, we are going to vote them out. Thank you. Osman, big hand for him. Right. We wave the flag together. Yeah, and after that, that's it. No? We have a press conference after this. Right. Osman Sulaima, another big hand for him. Right. Say no. To Sika. Say no. To 6.9. 6 Say no. no. To PAP. To PAP. Yes, thank you. Right After this, there will be a press conference. But if you want to stay back, you can. Right, You can ask us questions. The speakers will actually be lying up here. Right, the, the speakers, can you please come forward? Right, We'll be at the front here so that you know we can do it properly. Yeah. Oh. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, one thing that I have forgotten to mention earlier on, is that, listen carefully, uh, even PAP's own Deputy Prime Minister, today Mr. Shaman Tamugaratnam is a senior minister already. But when he said this sentence, he was a Deputy Prime Minister, and this is a PAP own Deputy Prime Minister. What did he say? I, I will say loudly and I will say clearly, uh, please listen. Sika, the free movement of people from India to Singapore, you know, professionals, huh? is bad economics and bad politics. Who said that? Taman Shamugaranam said that. I repeat, huh? I repeat. I repeat. Please, somebody can record it. Taman commented. PAP own Deputy Prime Minister said that Sika is bad economics and bad politics. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Singapore. Yeah, we actually need you to donate to this event generously, right? Dara, the one behind the young man, right? Wave a hand, Dara. There's two donation box. This event costs two thousand dollars. The stage costs eight hundred dollars, right? The sound system costs seven hundred and fifty dollars, plus all other utilities expenses. It costs me two thousand dollars, and I'm actually a very poor man. So if you can. Please help me. Please go to Dara. Dara, wave your hand again. Right, Dara is the one with two donation box. 
please donate to him generously. Right. You can give $100, $10, $1,000, $10,000 to him. Right. We need your funds so that we can move on together. Thank you, Singapore. Right. If you want to stay behind for the press conference, please do so. Right. If you want to ask a question from our speakers, please do so. Right. We are here to answer all your questions. Maybe we can come to the stage. Right. Is it okay? Is it easier to come to the stage? Yeah, I think it's easier, right? So that the press, uh, is there any press here in the first place? Right, any press here? Anyone from SPH, Singapore Press Holding? Oh, they dare not to come. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you from the audience want to ask us a question, you are allowed to, right? We are here to answer all your questions. Right, please come forward, all the speakers, right, so that we can actually uh, answer all your queries. Right, oh, don't be shy. We are here together. We are all Singaporeans. We are all here together. So maybe I'll ask someone to pass the mic to you. If you want to ask a question, right, raise your hand. I'll give you the mic. Right, don't be shy. Yeah, there's someone here. Yeah, sir. What's your name? Where are you from? Good evening to everyone. My name is Ariel. I'm from Israel. I'm here as a tourist. I'm very interested in politics. And here is my question. I would like to ask you, please, what is your first value as a nation, as a society? What is your motivation? Yeah. What's your value, you know, in my society? primary value is to see Singapore built into a just and democratic society where the rule of law stays with us and not being hijacked by a dictatorial regime. You in Israel knows that the value of democracy is what is keeping Israel a free fighting and a uh, dominant nation, in spite of being surrounded by enemies. So, I share the same value as most people of Israel. Osman, yeah. All the speakers, please come forward. Jochin, uh, Simon, can you please come forward? Yeah, uh, Sivan, want to answer the question. Okay, now, what has happened over the last 60 years? I believe... The country, which consists of the people, the government, and the ruling party are three separate entities. Okay? Although there may be some overlaps, but essentially they are separate. We cannot just merge them and blur the distinction among them for some interest of some special group, which in my view had taken place over the last 60 years. That is what we have to reverse the process and make sure the people get to see it and get it done with us. Thank you. Okay, Karina. I would like Singapore to become a true democratic country because at this moment we seem more like a communist country. We are not allowed we are not allowed to speak. We are not allowed we are not allowed to voice up and when we speak and voice up we're just being ignored we are my i mean my child, my my son is being trampled over being bullied my whole family is being bullied so this is what i want to see the change in singapore and that the only way that i can see this is if we, if we can get more opposition party into parliament so i hope um, in future i can see a government that puts singaporeans first and then sort out all our uh, concerning issues and listen uh, to us before they bulldoze any uh, policy that they think is good for us, but because they don't live at our level, so they wouldn't be able to understand. So with a consultative government, I think Singapore can move forward as Singaporeans. As for me, I know that every Singaporean is very sick about this issue. At the end of the day, those people who have voted last election, the 70%, please wake up. Let's give 
all oppositions our vote our vote to give them one and only chance to come in into parliament i believe that very strongly thank you yeah one more from the press yeah, anyone from the press really we want to give you a chance to ask a question if not we are passed to the audience Anyone from yeah, sir? No, I would like to ask one question. The old PAP, they they were selfless. They work for the people, and we are benefiting their hard work today. The current PAP is below par, and yet the people are still looking up to them. Why? I don't understand. Can anybody enlighten me on this? Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me just yeah. uh, attempt an answer. Now, to really answer this gentleman's question, all right, I need one hour, okay? But let me very shortly, the PAP in almost 60 years of rule, they completely and gradually dominated every aspect of our lives, from our education, from our income, from our jobs, from our healthcare, from the media, education, everything. And they have, through these years, because Singaporeans have voted them overwhelmingly at every general election, they get emboldened and more emboldened every time that they will get away with whatever measures that they implement which is to their advantage and not to the nation's advantage. Okay? Okay, thank you, Kwan. Yeah, maybe one last or two burning questions. Uh, no, no. Yeah, no. Yeah, maybe one or two more questions before we call it a day, right? Because it's getting dark. The camera cannot capture you. Uh, yes, sir. What's your name, sir? My name is Kula Sigarat. Okay. We are Tamil. We are not Indian. We are a punene and clink, yeah. One is in Turan, Unang is in Turan. P. Chengu, Nanga, Singapore, Chengu, Cho Sala, Inang Sion, the in Turan. Oh, ah, in Tolai, the in Turan, Singapore, two Siesic, a punene. Ah, Sinda, Sinda, HEB, LL, all these Indian organizations, they are cheating the Tamil. They are the Indian. We are not the Indian. I like the BAP government to tell that we are the Tamil people in Singapore. Okay. We have to destroy the Indian. We don't have the Indian category here. We are not Indians. Okay. We are the Singapore Tamil people. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Tamil. Right. We have to respect each other. Right. The Tamil. I know they feel that, you know, a lot of uh, Indians from India are here eroding the culture uh, yes yes i know so i think the tamils feel uh, level i think i have posted up a mail from a tamil person yeah so i think they feel uh, level they feel slighted uh. they feel that you know they are being overrun by indians from india so there's something serious right which i think the authorities the government need to look into because after a while wow the tamils are like left behind you know? the indians from india will take over and become the majority race for the Indians. Uh, yes, sir. One burning question from you, sir. Yes. After him, him you, uh, sir. Okay. Uh, my, que my question is this. Because uh, I feel a lot of university fresh graduate, they also very difficult to get a job. Six months or even longer, what I feel. But... But, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, because I feel a lot. I feel a lot of uh, pain for these fresh fresh graduate who are looking out for jobs, maybe six months or longer. But what is the real problem that? Uh, this fresh graduate cannot get a job. 
You want to say something, sir? Uh, sir, you want to say something, sir? Yeah, just a few words. Yeah, short one. Um, okay, I don't want to get a lot of media here. I'm a grassroots leader from People's Association. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I already spoke to... Because uh, always there's not too many K-pop players will take photos and you put in the WhatsApp in this group. And uh, very fact to tell you this, uh, okay, uh, People Association formed by our late father, Lee Kuan Yew, People Association is for Singaporeans. Today, PR are joining the grassroots, IAEC, RC, for their benefit. PA should stop the PR and give Singaporeans to serve. Okay, wow. Okay, lah. That one, uh, all right. Thanks, sir. What's your name, sir? Uh, give it. Are you joining the general election coming? Yeah, I'm taking part. Uh, last election, you're taking part, right? Uh, I hope you take part. How about all those on top, one? Uh? Anybody joining join the nation? Taking part in the nation? Ask a question now. <laughs> yeah, any one burning question, sir? Yeah, before the sky turned up, we have to go. The cameras cannot capture you. Yes, sir? Hey, just now there is, uh, no, someone talked about $66,000 per month, the person. Uh, actually, uh, I was in the uh, company. Our company image are very important. I only draw uh, $4,000 last uh, time. And therefore, sixty-six thousand dollar per month. Uh, this guy, uh, anyhow talk, anyhow do things, he should be sacked straight away. Not uh, give him uh, uh, nonsense, uh, what nonsense. Sack straight away, and then it's a it's a lesson for all these people to to up upgrade their or to hold their image. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. One last burning question, then we go off. Yeah, uh, no, that one. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, last question. Anyone? Before I, I also very hungry. I want to take my dinner. <laughs> okay, thank you. Right, if you don't have a question, thank the, all the speakers. A big hand for them. Right, thank you for coming. Right, it has been a very successful event. We thank you. Right, go home safely. Yes, take the bus and the MRT.